go ahead and start. We left off the other day um, on 606 and 607. You've got, hold on, I'm looking at two different sets. That's the old um, 606 and 607, you've got suggestions for approaching poetry, which are some of the things that I talked about before lo even looking at this, you know, about reading it aloud, pay attention to the title, pay attention to individual words, look at Mark's punctuation, etc. cetera. Um, go on to 611, and what I'm gonna do, try to do, very quickly today is go through a bunch of these pages just pointing out some of the um, terms in bold. So for example, on 611, just be aware of or make sure you know Cliches, stock responses, sentimentality. You know, when we talked about um, dog's death the other day, I think it was someone, it might have been you, who pointed out, you know, the poem was designed to kind of pull at your heartstrings, etc. Okay? It's an example of sentimentality. Um, notice on, on 611, that last paragraph, cliches, stock responses, sentimentality, are generally the hallmarks of weak writing. I mean, if that's all a poet can do is rely on cliches and draw out stock responses and, you know, design to make you cry, et cetera, um, that's not necessarily a deep thinker. And poetry is essentially about deep thinking. Um, Faulkner, who's short story, Barn Burning, we read. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. 1950, yeah, 1950. He said in, I think it was an interview, he said that he was a writer of stories, short stories and novels, because he wasn't a poet. And he went on to say, poets say the most in the least. That is, poets pack the most meaning in the least amount of words. Novelists take a large amount of words to get their point across. Poets take the least amount of words to get their point, to get their meaning across. 628 and 629, you've got a series of questions or statements um, that are designed to help you think about writing about poetry. Now, you're not doing any writing about poetry other than you know, responding to quizzes and such. But the same kinds of questions um, can serve to help you consider, think about, understand poems better, whether or not you are writing about them. Okay? Let's go on. Chapter 22, page 635 in the 11th edition. Dealing with word order, uh, excuse me, word choice, word order, and tone, and such. Very first term, diction. All diction is the word, the, the word you use, the language you use. And in in literature, there are different kinds of diction, just as there are different kinds of diction in your everyday life. Um, for example, you probably might be quite a bit of flexibility here. But assuming you have a full-time job, the odds are likely that you use a different kind of language. And I don't mean like French, German, English, but a different diction in your place of work than you do when you're relaxing with friends, okay? Um, you use a different kind of diction, different kinds of words and such, for example, out at a party with a bunch of friends, maybe a caterer or something like that, than you would if you were speaking to your boss in an office environment. That's all that this is getting at. Choice of words, okay? And on the next page, 636, 637, you have different kinds of diction mentioned. Poetic diction, okay? Use of elevated language rather than ordinary language. For example, the kind of language Shakespeare used 
in those two plays that we read. That's poetic diction. Shakespeare would have said, walking around or talking to his friends in everyday life, um, something like, he hath not heard so-and-so. What do I mean? The, the hath there, the H-A-T-H, rather than he has, okay? That was old, already by Shakespeare's day. In everyday ordinary usage, they didn't use that, nor did they use the thou or the th forms of pronouns. Those had already been replaced by the y forms, the use, in other words, okay? So, poetic diction, elevated language rather than ordinary language. Formal diction. Dignified, impersonal, and elevated. So it's kind of like the poetic, but elevated even higher. And you've got a little example there from Thomas Hardy's poem, The Convergence of the Twain, which is about the Titanic. You know, in a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity, and the pride of life that planned her, planned her stilly couches she. No one would say stilly couches she to refer to a shipwreck on the bottom of the ocean in everyday ordinary language, okay? That's, again, formal diction. Next term, middle diction. It's the kind of language spoken by most educated people. What was, I shouldn't throw this out there. I won't ask it as a question, I'll make it as a statement. One of the comments made, and I, this is nothing about politics, all right? This is just an example. One of the comments made about um, Herschel Walker's run for the Senate in Georgia is that he's not a, a good speaker. He's not a polished speaker, like Raphael Warnock is. Well, big difference in educational achievement and big difference in terms of job experience. Before he was elected senator, what was Raphael Warnock's job? Anybody know? Preacher. So he's used to standing up once a week and doing what? Speaking in, speaking in front of people. Big crowd. You have to develop polish for that kind of thing. Herschel Walker wasn't. He, he didn't regularly give speeches. He speaks in his everyday normal language. But it's not, in every, it's, it's not the language of a university graduate. He didn't graduate University of Georgia. He went three years and then went on to the pros, okay? So, middle diction, language spoken by most educated people. Educated there does not mean high school. It means college educated, all right? So, informal diction, okay? Conversational, colloquial English. That's, that's what Herschel Walker speaks. And, you know, he used it as tried to use it to his advantage. I'm like one of you. I'm an everyday ordinary person, okay? So it's just conversational, ordinary English. 637, dialect and jargon. Everybody knows what dialect is. Dialect is, you know, a form of language spoken by a particular group of people and it could be because of their geography, okay? Could be because of their educational attainment. That is, People with only a sixth grade education are going to speak a different quote unquote dialect than somebody else. Usually it's a, ge a geographical location. Southern dialect, New England dialect, etc. Jargon is entirely different. Depending on what your major is, you probably have a jargon in your major. If you're in aeronautics, aerospace, part of your jargon is very technical. It's referring to the dials and et cetera for flying. If you're in recording industry, your jargon is going to be very, very different. If it's computer programming, it's going to be very, very different. But what's the purpose of jargon? Is it to exclude others? Not necessarily. It's to include, it's to draw in the people within your own sphere, so to speak. That is the people within 
that particular skill set, job, employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Denotations and connotations, which I've already put up on the board once a few weeks ago. Denotations, literal dictionary definitions of meanings, connotations, all the other possibilities that those words suggest. And the example I used one day was blue. The literal dictionary definition is the color, but it can also refer to mood, Attitude, you know, things like that, okay? Turn the page. 639, persona. Persona is the speaker of a poem. Even if the poem is not intended to be literally spoken, it's the I that is essentially saying the poem. We use persona, not narrator. The narrator is the person speaking in a work of fiction, short story, novel, etc. Look very briefly at the poem on page 638, all right, by Randall Jarrell. So this poem may show up on a quiz or the, or the final exam. Death of the Ball Turret Gunner. Remember, titles give you an indication of what is happening. So what has the title just told us? Someone's going to die. What is a ball turret gunner? Turrets are back in World War II. Don't think these were used as much in Korea or Vietnam. Turrets are on the, are on the back of bombers, um, usually on the back, top of the fuselage, hanging down at the bottom of the fuselage, a round or glass ball, and the person inside would be in a seat and that seat would rotate. It wouldn't rotate. Don't believe they rotated 360 degrees. Some of them might have, but it's the person whose job is to sit there like with a 50 cal machine gun. And when other fighters or bombers are coming up, fighter jets are coming up on the bomber, it's that person's job to shoot them out of the sky, okay? If you've seen Star Wars, it's what Luke and Han Solo do when they're being pursued by, you know, fighter jets and such. So the ball turret gunner, the person sitting in the ball turret, is going to die. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state. The I is the persona, okay? From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loose from its dream of life. I woke to black flack in the nightmare fires. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Now we could rephrase that, we could paraphrase that. And you've got a little one there, okay? I don't, I don't wanna take the poem entirely apart, but you know, for example, I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. If this is a gunner sitting in a turret, how does he have wet fur? Blood. Okay, but what's the fur? Probably a coat or something he wears. What does a person in a bomber wear? The bomber jacket. Yeah. They're highly valued today. If you can get an original bomber jacket, they're several hundred or thousands of dollars. You got all kinds of knockoffs being made. Leather on the outside, lined with real fur on the inside. Why? Bombers weren't heated. These. Guys are flying 25, 30,000 feet. Temperatures below zero, right? Or near zero. Um, and there's other stuff there. So notice the I, I, I. Well, this poem is given as an example for talking about persona. So that's the speaker. Down a little bit later in that, on page 639. Ambiguity. Notice that poem has some ambiguity, okay? My wet fur, it's not clear what the wetness is caused by. Is it caused by blood? Well, the speaker's not dead at that point. What kind of situation is a ball turret gunner in when, I'm gonna use masculine pronoun because in World War II they were all men, um, when he's firing a weapon? High stress. So? He's sweating. He's sweating. Why is the fur frozen? 
because that sweat is freezing almost immediately. So he's generating, his body is generating wetness and it's freezing inside him, okay? Six miles from earth, that gives us how far up he is, over 30,000 feet. So ambiguity allows for two or more simultaneous interpretations of a word, phrase, action, paragraph, title, uh, stanza, title, etc. Again, as opposed to writers of prose nonfiction, like an essayist, okay, or a person delivering a speech, a poet intends to be ambiguous. A poet wants to choose a word that gives possibly more than one meanings. If you remember when we talked about Hamlet in his uh, initial soliloquy, we talked about the difference between these two words, sullied and solid. Oh, that this two two sullied flesh, or oh, that this two two solid flesh. Sullied is more ambiguous. And in that sense, a better reading than solid, because solid reduces it to just physicality. Sullied implies physicality, because something has to be material, kind of, for it to be sullied, unless it's something like a reputation, okay? But sullied implies also beyond just solidity, dirtiness, taintedness, all right? So, context therefore becomes all important for how to determine what a word means or what it connotes or what a line or etc. connotes. Word order, page 640. Word order is syntax, or syntax is word order. Modern English, in terms of how we speak and how we generally write, has what's called an SVO order, subject, verb, object. I... Subject, verb, ran, object, to the store. Okay? Not necessarily in the same way in, in poetry. Many times, uh, poets will put the verb at the end. Sometimes you won't know the subject till the middle. Till the middle you know? Yoda in Star Wars doesn't speak subject, verb, object. Yeah, it's funny he was. You know, you got the adjective coming after, before the subject and then the verb. All right? Tone. We talked about tone with fiction. Author's attitude towards whatever the material is. You know, go back and look at the death of the ball turret gunner. Is the tone happy? Joyful? No, it's kind of somber. It's, it's kind of melancholy. All right? Let's go on. Uh, page 440, excuse me, 645. Now I'm doing it, like I said, flipping through pages and looking at specific terms. 645, Carpe Diem. If you ever saw a Dead Poet Society, you know what this term means, okay? Seize the day, it's a Latin phrase. Seize the day. What does it imply? What does Hamlet mean when Hamlet says the readiness is all? You have to be prepared to do, you have to be prepared to die every minute of every day. Seize the day, carpe diem, means take what you can, make what you can of your life right now. Why? Because you don't know that tomorrow holds anything. You don't know that there is a tomorrow. And you have an example of a poem, to the virgins to make much of time which I have actually on the syllabus for a little bit later, but I don't see it. So, yeah, there it is. So let's look at it. It's actually in the syllabus for the material for today. Robert Herrick, 17th century poet, Okay. He was also an Anglican priest to the virgins to make much of time. So what's the title telling us? 
Who's it directed to? Virgins. Male or female? We don't know. There's this assumption that virgin tends to refer to females, but it doesn't. So it's to the virgins to do what? Make the most of your time. Okay? So, it's written in stanzas. We have four stanzas. The stanzas are called, we're going to talk about this later, stanzas are called quatrains. They're four-line stanzas that rhyme. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. So we get the idea, the theme of the poem. Time is flying. A flower that smiles today, that is blooms today, tomorrow will be dying. Okay? Second stanza. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a-getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. So the first stanza introduces time. The second stanza introduces a different image, the image of the sun rising and falling. That third stanza. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer. But being spent, the worst in worst times still succeed the former. So we go from time, kind of generally speaking, to a day, or time and a flower, to a day and the sun rising and setting, to the ages of life. Youth and older age. Then be not coy, but use your time, and while you may go marry. For having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. All right? So, what's the speaker saying? What is the persona saying? Your life is governed by time. Time runs out. Therefore, Use the time that you still have in the hourglass before all those sands drip away. And he uses four different stanzas to give four different images. And the final image is, Be not coy, but use your time, and while you may, go marry. Now, go marry may mean go get married. But it can also mean go merry, go happily, go joyfully. Are we ever told the sex of the intended recipient? No, we're not. Okay. But what is one of the things the poet implies? What does time do to people? How are you different when you're 20 than when you're 70? Life experience. Life experience. What else? Be more superficial. Maturity. Be even more superficial. Looks. When you're 20, if you're a man, you're handsome. If you're, generally speaking, if you're a man, you're handsome. If you're a woman, you're beautiful. 70? Not so much. Body sagging. You've got wrinkles. You've got gray hair. All that kind of stuff, okay? We're going to come back to this poem again later. Um, I'm not going to do To His Coy Mistress yet. We'll come back to it later also. I'm going to go through and do more of these terms. So, we'll talk about Carpe Diem poems again a little bit in a little bit. So, let's go through more terms. Chapter 23, or section 23, images, okay? Everybody knows what an image is. It isn't only visual. This is page 669. An image is anything that appeals to the senses. Can be visual. It can be a smell. It can be a color. It can be a taste. It can be a texture that is described, okay? Anything that appeals to one of the five senses or more than that. And you've got examples. Um, 
I'm going to see. I don't remember. I want to see if they have another poem by William Carlos Williams. Which I ought to have memorized, but... Yeah. On page... Turn very briefly to page 808. Take that back. Don't, don't turn to it. Just write, note it down. This could show up. Just listen to this. Okay? The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. What is in your mind now? Red wheelbarrow. An image of a red wheelbarrow glazed, wet, beside white chickens. Okay? The poem is entirely imagistic. That's all it's doing. It's creating an image. What does it mean? It depends upon how you interpret. So much depends upon. Okay? The poem is entirely meant. Its whole purpose is to evoke that image. And probably throughout the day, this image is going to pop into your mind of a red wheelbarrow covered with rainwater sitting beside white chickens. That's it. Okay? Um... Let's go on. Uh, we're going to come back to that poem later. Next section. Images. 87. Figures of speech. 688, 689, following. Okay. Figures of speech. A way of saying one thing in terms of another. That's what a figure of speech is. Okay. For example... I don't know if this is the, the order that's going to come, you know, next. Simile and metaphor. What's a simile? What are both similes and metaphors? Ways of comparing things, okay? Similes use like in as. He ran like a gazelle. Her hair is beautiful as the sun. Okay, those are both similes. He, compared to a gazelle, her hair compared to the brightness or the yellow of the sun. A metaphor is when you make a comparison, but you don't use like or as. You say the thing is something else. He's a pig. Has two meanings, right? One, eats an awful lot. Two, is foul and dirty, okay? Possibly three meanings, you know, sexually uh, unattractive, etc., etc. Look at the little poem on 690. I love this poem. Just because of the image it creates. Okay, this is talking about simile and metaphor. You Fit Into Me by Margaret Atwood. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. Now, if we just stop there, what are the connotations of hook and eye? Probably. If you have a dress, men generally don't have this in their clothing, but a woman's dress, if it has a zipper up the back, the zipper will go up, and how do you keep the zipper from going back down? It has a hook, and it has a little loop on the other side. And that's the eye. Or if you wear any kind of necklace, I don't know where this part is, you've got a little hook on this side, and a loop on this side, that's the eye. So hook and eye. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. Okay? In other words, these two things go together. It's a beautiful image. A fish hook, an open eye, and the next two lines completely jar 
the initial image. Because we think of the other, the sewing hook and eye, not a fish hook with its barbs and an actual physical fleshly eye. So how do you fit into me? It's we not, don't fit. This isn't a, a beautiful relationship that's kind of, you know, being implied. So, simile, explicit comparison, using words, words like like, as, than, appears, seems, etc., etc. Metaphor, makes a comparison between to unlike things, but does it implicitly, okay? The hook, the eye, in the second two lines, all right? So on 691, metaphor is expanded because there are different kinds of metaphors. You have implied metaphors, okay? For example, he braid his refusal to leave. The implication is that he's like an ass or like a donkey, all right? It doesn't explicitly say he's an ass. It uses a term applied to asses or donkeys in reference to a person. An extended metaphor, okay, um, in terms of a poem, makes the entire poem fill out or be about that metaphor. And you've got a, you know, the reference to the poem, it was on a previous page, Catch on page 596 by Robert Francis, okay? That compares poetry to a game of catch, okay? A controlling metaphor, um, because these comparisons are worked throughout the entire poem, they're called controlling metaphors. For example, Look at the controlling metaphor in the poem, the author to her book by Anne Bradstreet. Now we're gonna discuss that poem later, all right? But the controlling metaphor is she refers to, to put it bluntly, she refers to her book as a child. Or, let me rephrase that. The poems in the book as her children. And she uses that metaphor all the way throughout. Okay? Anne Bradstreet, by the way, again, we'll talk about her a little bit more when we do this poem. Anne Bradstreet is the first American poet. Published poet. First American published poet is a woman writer. All right? Page 693. We all know what a pun is when you make a play on words. Shakespeare, for example, loves to pun on the word tail. With both spellings, both, you know, kind of meanings. But he uses, you know, the pun tail referring to, I'm trying to think of a clean term, booty. Okay, sex, female sex primarily, all right? 695. Um, two different terms. Um, yeah, I know what they are. I don't think I've ever included them on a quiz or exam before, but um, synecdoche, also pronounced synecdoche in metonymy. Um, Synecdoche, a figure of speech in which part of something is used to signify the whole, or synecdoche, figure of speech in which something, part of something is used to signify the whole. So, for example, you know, Washington, D.C. said, or Washington said. It doesn't refer to the town of Washington, it refers to the federal government. So you have a little poem, hand that signed the paper by Dylan Thomas as an example of Synecdoche, synodosh, etc. Personification, everybody knows what that what is. You know, you attribute human characteristics to something inhuman, which we saw, if you remember, in um come on, brain, get up to speed. Flannery O'Connor, good man is hard to find. 
we heard this, the woods described as an open mouth or as swallowing, okay? That's personification. 697, paradox and oxymoron. Paradox, statement that looks to be self-contradictory, but on second look, it's not, it makes sense. Oxymoron, it, an even denser form of paradox, you know, like sweet sorrow, silent screen, virgin maid, or maid virgin, cold fire. They're not truly oxymoron. That is, they're not truly opposites. Within their context, they work. Um, figures of speech go on to symbol. Page 710 and following. Symbol we've already discussed with um, fiction. It's pretty much the same kind of thing. Symbols work the same way in poetry as they do in fiction and in drama. Just uh, Yeah, I've got this poem assigned. So we, we will look later at Robert Frost's Acquainted with the Night in a couple of days. We'll come back to that. 712, conventional symbol, things we, we've discussed, literary, contextual symbols. That is, the contextual or literary symbol, the meaning of it depends upon the actual context it's, in which it's used. As an example, and I'm not gonna explain it right now, but when we get to Acquainted with the Night, look at how the moon is used. So if you want to just put a note, you know, moon in um, acquainted with the night, okay? Or darkness, or even night. The night, the term night becomes a symbol for a variety of things, okay? Allegory, we've talked about that. Allegories where there's only one meaning. Only one meaning is possible. And it's because the author is determining the meaning for you. Notice, unlike expansive suggestive syllable, uh, symbols, allegory is a narration or description usually restricted to a single meaning because its events, actions, characters, etc., etc., represent specific abstractions or ideas. And I used the example in talking about fiction of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where you have the character, the main character is a person named Christian. Christian can never stand within that novel for Muslim, Jew, Buddhist, atheist, okay? Allegory, next term on, the, on page 713, is almost always, I mean like 95, 98% didactic. The person writing the allegory is trying to teach you a message, okay? Um, what's one of the greatest allegories of the 20th century? You might have had to read this like in middle school or high school. George Orwell, Animal Farm. If you never had to read it, you should read it. Set literally on a farm with a bunch of animals who take control and you have the animals set up essentially a communist state. It's Orwell's allegory about the dangers of communism or socialism, if you want, okay? Um, and notice, the, the lesson that's taught can be anything. It can be an ethical lesson, a moral lesson, religious lesson, secular lesson, um, Irony we've talked about. Look very briefly. I don't think I have the poem. Yeah, I don't have it on the syllabus. Page 715, about irony. Look at this poem by Edwin Arlington Robinson. Richard Corey. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean, clean and favored, and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked, but still he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. 
In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. Notice the first 14 lines imply, man, this guy is someone to be looked up to, someone to be admired. And then we find out what? He's depressed, suicidal, okay? That's the irony of the poem. Uh, da, 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 da. Go to 716, situational irony, ver verbal irony. We've talked about those in relation to both drama and fiction. Um, Sounds, pages 730 and following. Dramatic irony on 718. Again, we've talked about that. 730. 731, ballads. Two different kinds of ballads mentioned. Okay, just plain ballad and literary ballad. You've got a, an example of a ballad, Scarborough Fair, on page 731. We're going to discuss, we're going to discuss this poem in Simon and Garfunkel's Scarborough Fair, modification, adaptation of it, um, in a few days. So we're not going to talk about it right now. But, but... Know the definitions on those pages, or on that page, okay? A um, couple of terms relating just to sounds. On 734 and 735, okay? Onomatopoeia, you probably remember from grade school, if not later, okay? where the repetition or the use of a word re resembles the sound it connotes, quack, buzz, rattle, etc., etc. Alliteration is the repetition of the same consonant sounds at the beginnings of nearby words. We've seen that used in a lot of the, in, well, in some of the um, dramas we've read, and you've got examples, okay? Assonance, repetition of the same vowel sound in nearby words, okay? Sleep under a tree, time and tide, haunt, awesome, each, eat, etc. If the repetition of the sound produces a harmonious or pleasing effect, then it's called euphony. You meaning beautiful, phony, sound, beautiful sound. If it's a jarring sound, if it doesn't sound pretty, it's cacophonous or cacophony, okay? Discordant, in other words. Rhyme, 736, 737, okay? Two or more words or phrases that repeat the same sounds. Happy, snappy, okay? So rhyme often has similar spellings, but you can have I rhyme, as I mentioned the other day, you know? with this kind of thing. Bow and though. They don't literally rhyme sound-wise, but they look very similar. Which is, you know, they use the example bow and cough. Um, 738, 739, different kinds of rhyme. End rhyme is exactly what it sounds like, where you have rhyme at the ends of lines of poetry. Internal rhyme, where there within a line of poetry, there are rhyming sounds. For example, look on the previous page, on page 738, line 30 and 31. 30, dividing, gliding, sliding, iding, iding, iding. It's internal rhyme. The next line, falling, brawling, sprawling, alling, 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 internal rhyme, okay? Um, masculine rhyme, rhyming of single syllable words, now, bow, etc. okay? So sliding um, and striving, 
on lines 30 and 32 on the previous page, those are not masculine rhymes. Feminine rhyme consists of a rhymed syllable, a rhymed stressed syllable, followed by one or more rhymed unstressed syllables. Sliding, striving, those are feminine rhymes because the I part is stressed and the ing part is unstressed, but both of them also rhyme, okay? Bottom of 739, exact rhymes, okay? Because they're exact, everything fits perfectly, but then you also have what's called, and there's a variety of ways to describe this. You also have what's called near rhyme. And notice three other terms to describe near rhyme. Off rhyme, that is it's close, but not perfect. Slant rhyme and approximate rhyme. So there could be a quiz that says, give me another term for approximate rhyme or near rhyme or slant rhyme. Or there might be an example that says, what kind of rhyme is this? Any one of those four terms, all right? One of the most common examples of near, slant, approximate, off rhyme is the use of consonants. An identical consonant sound preceded by a different vowel. Home, same, mm, okay? Worth, breath, th. Trophy, defi, the fee there, okay? Close, but it's not perfect. Um, sounds, patterns of rhythm. I don't know that we're going to... Yeah, we'll do some of this. So, seven, pages 755 through, just want to make sure, 758, okay? Uh, 754 through 758. 754. Rhythm, the recurrence of stressed and unstressed syllables, right? Those sounds are like syllables. Some are stressed and some are unstressed. Stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, like a heartbeat, right? So some principles of meter, page 755 and following. A stress is the, is the accent or the syllable that has more emphasis on stress is the stress at the syllable that doesn't have stress, okay? When you have a pattern that occurs, you have what's called meter, okay? When a rhythmic, bottom of 755, when a rhythmic pattern of stresses recurs in a poem, the result is meter. Taken all together in a poem or group of poems, the elements of stress and unstress altogether are called prosody. So scansion is when you go through and you scan the poem to try to determine what its meter is. What are the stressed and unstressed syllables and such? Hickory, dickory, you know, for example, hickory, dickory, dock, the mouse ran up the clock. Notice mouse, the is unstressed, mouse ran up the clock. You have stress, uh, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress in those lines, okay? On 756, foot, okay? It's the metrical unit by which a line of poetry is measured. How so? A foot consists of one stress and one or two unstressed syllables. That's all you need to know for purposes of me in this class, okay? A foot is a stressed and an unstressed syllable or two. I'm not requiring you to know all these different examples. For example, an I am, a troche, an anapest, a dactyl, a sponde, etc. You don't need to know those terms. You do need to know foot, okay? Rising meter, um, And falling meters, you should know those. 
okay, where the stress and unstressed syllables in a rising meter, the unstressed syllables come first and then the stress ends at the end. In a falling meter, the stress syllable comes first and then the unstressed syllables follow that. And you got examples mentioned. A line is a line of poetry, but a line is measured by the number of feet stressed and unstressed syllables it has. Pentameter, for example, has 10 penta stressed and unstressed syllables. Most English, well, up until 19th century or so, um, most Renaissance poems, for example, are written in iambic pentameter, okay? Iambic, you start off with an unstressed syllable, then you have a stressed syllable. So iambic pentameter is 10 feet, 10 of those unstressed stress, unstressed press, unstressed uh, stress, etc. All right? Blank verse is where you have an unrhymed iambic pentameter, okay? Shakespeare's, poet, uh, Shakespeare's plays are written in iambic pentameter, all right? But it's, it doesn't rhyme. Iambic pentameter doesn't rhyme. Some of Shakespeare's plays do use a lot of rhyme. Some of them don't, all right? Um, bottom of 757. Masculine ending, feminine ending. When a line ends with a final, uh, excuse me, when a line ends with a stressed syllable, it has masculine, a masculine ending. And when it ends with an unstressed syllable, it has a feminine ending. So you have the two examples. The sand at my feet grow colder. Any er at the end is unstressed. The damp air chill and spread. The spread is emphasized in stress. So that's a masculine. Okay. Um, last thing, 758. The break between two parts of a line, okay, or the break between two halves of a line is called the sesura. It's a pause, right? Notice the line just beneath that, the middle of 758. Camaraldo, comma, I'll give you my hand. Notice that's a line of poetry. So after that comma, there's a pause. It's the the oral pause that we were talking about the other day. I give you my love, pause, more precious than money, right? When the pause comes at the end of a line, it's called an end stopped line. If it doesn't, like we were talking about, um, which poem? The other day with, Um, those winter Sundays on 591. For example, Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black clothes, uh, blue black cold. That's a run on or in jam line, right? Because it goes from one to the next. It's jammed up. That's what in jam means. If it stops at the end, I shouldn't have done that. For example, line two in on 591, those winter Sundays, and put his clothes on in the blue, black, coal, comma, okay? That's an in stopped line. The first line is a in and jam line because it goes on to that line, all right? Um, poetic forms, 775. We'll talk about those Monday. Wait, today's right. Yeah. We'll talk about those on Monday and then look at, again, to the virgins to make much of time, to its coy mistress, the author to her book, and a valediction for bidding morning. Uh, we should be able to do all four of those without any problem.
All right, we'll stop there. Have a good weekend.